Karam, wherever you are, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> as all of you should already know that the numbers uh, of invect infest. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, infected people in India has largely remained in control for the population that we are. 735 is not a very bad number, but there is a, a bit of a lacuna in that because confirmed cases means they went into testing about a week ago. So it takes six to seven days for it to be confirmed. So, it could be little more than that, but compared to many other countries, uh, it's very much in control. I think we went into the lockdown at an appropriate time before it became uh, community spreading. Still, wherever these confirmed cases are, we are able to trace down from where it came most of them have traveled abroad and come. But in many other nations, unfortunately, it is just going crazy. Well, even the Prime Minister of uh, United Kingdom 
is confirmed with coronavirus right now. Prince Charles is confirmed. So across the island it is spreading. New York City is over 10,000 people. Uh, so in United States there is partial lockdowns, I think. Mm, they have an advantage of space which UK may not have. Spain, deaths are going over 2,300. Italy is still doing the same. So, this is a situation, but we also know that uh, a whole lot of people will recover. But the problem will be that in a given society or a nation, if too many people go into infection state, it'll be impossible for any nation to provide necessary medical uh, assistance that they would need. That is when people will start dying in large numbers. So that's what we are trying to prevent with this lockdown. And uh, there are strategies in India that even if they relax it within the state, between the states the lockdown will continue for a more period of time probably, because they want to break the chain of infection that's happening. If a certain number of people are infected in a city, after that stopping it from not touching others is very difficult. There are tragic instances where yesterday a health worker in Atlanta, I think forty-two-year-old lady, she's been working in a hospital, she went home and uh, she died. A four-year-old child was next to her, nobody else in the house and she just died of corona. So these kind of tragic stories are coming. So I want everyone, every one of you, in whichever way you can communicate, ensure that everybody maintains physical distance and you should not be the cause of the problem. That much you must take care. Well, those of you who are always little lazy, that you always cursed about going to work, those of you who are, thank God, it's Friday kind of people, this is your time. At least have a good time for three weeks or four weeks or whatever it turns out to be. The economic packages are being unfolded both in United States and in India in a big way. Everything is being pushed. It's almost like for three months we did not live, that's how it will be. And we again came back. It's like the Gulliver experience, but only three months. So, uh, the most important thing is that people don't become fearful and start doing stupid things. People don't become fearful and start running on the streets. Very important that all of you maintain your physical and mental balance. This is a great time to address ourselves. When I look back and see, in the last three decades or nearly four decades, never or in my whole life, never I got three weeks where I can do something with myself. It never happened. So here I am. So I want you also to make use of this in the best possible manner. Three weeks is a lot of time. If we put enough effort into three weeks, we can come out physically stronger and fitter, mentally more stable and with more potential. Energetically and spiritually, we can do many, many things in three weeks full-time work. Well, many of you have attended programs and you have seen, in a two-day program or a four-day program, life has taken a huge shift. Three days of Bhavasmandana, life got turned upside down. 
So this is your time to do your thing. That really, that you become a life that will soar. Yes. Let us not complain about anything and everything that comes our way. The virus is doing its job. We must do ours. This is important. We don't do virus's job, we do ours. If you transport virus from yourself to another person or from another person to you and you to somebody, you are doing the job of the virus. You are a virus party. If you don't cooperate with the virus, that means you're doing what you want to do. This is the time. This is a given vacation. Well, it's going to set us back economically on various levels. Individuals, families, communities, nations, the entire world's economy probably will fall back a little bit. It's okay. I'm saying it'll hurt. It'll hurt all of us, it'll hurt us as an institution, but it's all right. Maybe we will live the way we lived five years ago or ten years ago. There was nothing wrong at that time, it was fine. We will just be like that. So the most important thing is, we are alive and we have a vacation. Let's put it to good use, but people are complaining, people are having just three days, already home is becoming repressive for a lot of people. All these days they were complaining, where is my husband, I see him only once in a week, where is my wife, she's going to work, I can't see her, I'm missing you, you're missing me now. <laughs> we are missing the office. Well, human relationships are like this. When you're together, it's a problem, when you're away, it's a problem. When they're away, there's only one problem, you just miss them. When they're together, there are multiple problems. <laughs> this happened. At one time, Shankaran Pillai was a weekend golfer. That is every weekend he golfs. So one Saturday morning he was putting on his shoes. The wife came and uh, she was in an emotional mood. She said, every weekend you're going away golfing, you don't love me, you love this golf game more than me. Shankaran Pillai tightened the lace. <laughs> And then he said, see Lakshmi, it is true, I love the golf game more than you. But let me tell you, I love you more than the cricket, tennis, football put together. <laughs> so uh, it's time, it's time we address who we are, what are we made of. What is our limitation? It's time to address that. So this is a good time for that. Let's not fool ourselves, oh, you know, fanciful ideas that you picked up in romantic novels and movies and stuff. It's time we address who we are. You got issues. If you got issues, we must face them. We think the issue is somebody else. No, no, we've got issues as people time to face them, very, very important. If you could do it every day, on the fly, doing all the work, that would be fantastic. But if you could not do that, this is a time when you sit by yourself, all the troubles you're having, obviously yours. The boss is not around. You can't blame it on him. The traffic is not bad anymore, you're not even there. You can't blame it on the traffic, why you're freaked. You don't have to go to office on the time, so you can't blame it on that. You're sitting at home and freaking, obviously it's you. It's time to address that. Human relationships, 
become what they become mainly because most people think the other person should be the source of my joy. No, it's your business to see that you are the source of the joy, of joy for the other person. Everybody is always wanting to meet that wonderful person who doesn't exist. Actually, I have enough experience in love, I'm telling you, such a person doesn't exist. Because even, uh, you know, today everybody, at least in India, people's idea of the most beautiful and wonderful human being is Krishna. He dances, he sings, he loves and it's fantastic he is, all right? But his wives were complaining endlessly during their time. So even his wives were complaining because you always think somebody else has to be wonderful. It's time, these three weeks is a good amount of time that you become that wonderful person that you're aspiring to meet. You become that wonderful person that you're expecting everybody else to be. This is your chance. If you become that wonderful person, well, others also can enjoy it. But above all, you enjoy it. That's the most important thing. If you sit here, if you are a wonderful human being, you enjoy this. Well, others also can enjoy it, that's wonderful. But if they are not around, you enjoy being a wonderful human being. You are in the company of a wonderful human being always. This everybody must do. And now this virus has given you this possibility of three days at home, Good time to do it, a few of you at the ashram, rest of you at home, good time to do it, very good time. Let's make use of this. Hmm? Question? Sadhguru, the first question is from S. Upadhyay. Namaskaram Sadhguru, while speaking about Dhyalinga, you had mentioned that you can access it from anywhere. From the past few months, I have a very intense longing to experience your life presence 24-7, wherever in the world I may be. Could you please give me a method to make this possible? What is your understanding of life? You want me on the web all the time? Because today live does not mean I'm alive. Live means I'm on online. So, let's understand this. What you think you are right now is, this is me. Well, we have done enough of this talk with you, enough processes with you, that what you consider as your body is an accumulation. So it's yours, cannot be you. Other thing is what's all… what all mess that's happening in your head, you think it's me, the content of the mind. Well, that is also an accumulation, that is also yours <laughs> because nobody else wants to have it. So, uh, it's yours, but it's not you. So what you consider or what you do not know as myself, but you know you exist, but you do not know what is the nature of your existence. So the whole idea of spiritual process and the tools that are established to manifest this or bring this experience into people's lives, <clears throat> all the tools, whether it is Dhyana Linga or Yogeshwara or myself, this is a tool, this is not a person. The tool is that something beyond physical is happening around them all the time. Physicality, the basis of physicality is a defined boundary. Without a defined boundary, there is no physical nature. So once something beyond physicality is happening, there is no such thing as boundary. 
there is no such thing as here and there. Physical can only be either here or there. That which is not physical is neither here nor there or it is both here and there. Well, this may sound little out of reach for you, but normally for most human beings, I would say over ninety percent of the human beings, they can pay attention to something, absolutely, only if they're emotionally involved with it. Very few human beings have a mind which can give them absolute involvement without any emotional involvement. That takes a lot of work. To have a mind that you can stay focused on something absolutely without emotionally being involved with it. But I would say for ninety percent of the people, they need emotional support to pay attention to something absolutely. This is the reason only those people who you think are in the ambit of your love, you pay attention to them. Those who are not, you ignore, you cannot pay attention to them. So because of this, spiritual process always mixes up a very simple aspect to bring focus we talk about devotion, emotion, all this stuff. Is it really needed? No. If you could simply absolutely be, you don't need any emotion, you don't need any devotion. Just sitting here, dry as a stick, you can still reverberate with the energies of this universe. But, that is a very small number of people. Others need some kind of... Something has to tug them in their heart, otherwise they will not look in that direction. They will look for a few seconds and they'll be here, there, everywhere. Only where they're emotionally involved, they're able to keep a steady focus towards that. Whatever emotionally matters to you, becomes the focus of your mind. So it's a wonderful tool that way. So because of that, we brought emotion into the system. Once we brought emotion, <laughs> you know emotion, it's like that. Because it's like that, channelizing that is a huge challenge and unnecessarily it looks complicated because each person starts interpreting it in, the, in their own way because each person's emotion is unique in its own way. So do not get trapped in all those things. Do not worry about what somebody else is doing, how it happens to somebody else. This is why in Isha we've always stopped people from sharing their spiritual experiences because others will get confused. If you say, I'm lying... I was lying down, you know, I was just uh, lying down somewhere in some other part of the world, wherever you are, Mr. what? Acharya? Upadhyaya. Upadhyaya. Uh, Sadhguru came. And so much trouble for me, because all kinds of people now will start saying, Sadhguru came and did this, Sadhguru came and did that, usually it starts with good things. Then after some time, <laughs> every nonsense that they do, Sadhguru... Right now it's happening to God. Fortunately, he is not here, so it's okay, you can blame him for any damn thing, but you can't access him, so... I'm saying at least you cannot punish him, so it's okay. For everything, all the nonsense that happens, I think God wills like this, that's why I'm doing all this idiotic stuff. Now once this thing gets focused on a living person like me, phew, too much trouble. Well, can we make the presence be available wherever you are? 
of course, otherwise what's the point? Then it'll be just talking spirituality. Talking spirituality can be inspiration at its best and entertainment at its worst. That's all it can be, talking about it, talking about it, talking about it. We... inspiration is needed in the beginning, but if you need inspiration throughout your life, you're a lost case. Inspiration is... it's like ignition, got the engine started. Once you have the engine started, if you keep turning the ignition, it makes ugly noises. Same will happen to people, once they're sufficiently inspired, there is no need to go on inspiring them, they will become fanatics. If you go on inspiring people, they will become madcaps who will do most illogical and terrible things in the world. Too much inspiration. Inspiration is like ignition to get somebody started, a little bit push. After that it's over. After that, they must have processes and methods with which they can access. More than anything, somehow, whichever way, involvement. So we are talking about a conse consecrated form like Dhyanalinga, or myself or yourself. When we initiated you, I have spoken about this but largely we are avoiding talking about it, we are still calling Shambhavi as initiation, it's not really an initiation because nothing is given, it's a kind of a consecration. All you have to do, your daily practice, <laughs> it is not like Shakti Chalana Kriya or Shunya meditation where there is a specific process. Here all you're doing is, it's like you... it's like sweeping the temple. People every day are sweeping Dhyanalinga temple. They are not recharging Dhyanalinga or doing something. There are no rituals, there are no processes. Just sweeping the temple, keeping it clean. This is all you're doing with Shambhavi. You are not doing anything to boost yourself. Just keeping it clean because it's consecrated. If you don't keep it clean, suppose if you do not keep your window panes clean, suddenly even the sun doesn't seem to be bright enough. Even the sun is not bright enough because your window panes are not clean. Or you got a cataract, suddenly even the sun is not bright enough. This can easily happen. So all you have to do is keep it clean. Sadhguru, I'm doing my practice once a month, I'm sorry, once a day. <laughs> I'm just being mean, just like that, you know, it's a holiday. <laughs> if you're doing your practice every day, to some extent it's clean. But maybe the rest of the day you're completely oblivious of it. So one simple thing you can do is use something, anything. Maybe a picture, maybe a mantra, maybe just a sound, maybe just a, a reminder on your phone, just anything that mentally, emotionally you just get connected to that aspect as many times as possible in a day. That if you close your eyes, only that appears. Right now still all those cinema stars and others are appearing, so you're not feeling it, it's not that it's not there. You're not... see, when you do the practice, you feel it. During the day you're not feeling it because you let other things dance. Item numbers are happening. So you do anything, use anything you want, maybe a reminder on the phone, maybe a picture that you will look at it, or a phone screen, you know, you put something as a screensaver or a chant, you yourself chant or you listen to a chant, do something. All we are trying to do is mentally, emotionally, you're focused in one direction. If you do this much, the presence will be strong. Even now it's there, but like with cataract, how can you see? 
you're just trying to remove the cataract, that's all. It's very much possible to experience any dimension of life which is not limited by physical nature. You have no problem feeling it and experiencing it and knowing it. Distance is not an issue, there is no distance for non-physical dimension. Distance is a manifestation of physicality. If there's an inch, there is a mile, if there's a mile, there is ten thousand miles, that's how it is. From an inch to a light year, there is distance only because of physical objects. If there is no physicality, distance means nothing. So this is not a physical dimension. So feeling it, knowing it, experiencing it will not be a challenge if there is a certain amount of focus towards that. Do you create your own device, how to remind yourself every few minutes or once an hour or whatever you like, it will happen. Sadhguru, the next question is from Sonia. Namaskaram Guruji, mm -hmm. I am from Berlin. With increased silence outside, inside noises are becoming very noisy. Could you shed some light on inner vibrations and the inner sound? Whoa! In Berlin? Ah. Usually people don't call me Guruji because uh, Guruji is a honorific. I'm very embarrassed with such things. Sadhguru is a description. Just like saying uh, an orthopedic or an ophthal ophthalmologist or a gynec or a neurologist, just like that, Sadhguru is just a description. I don't mind the description because it says an uneducated guru, nobody comes and confronts me with scriptures because they know anyway I don't know it. Just to ensure that we don't spend time trying to debate, discuss something that we have no clue about and we have never bothered about. But Guruji is a honorific, don't do that to me. Uh, I've lived in a certain way, in the sense <laughs> uh, I've lived in such a way that people around me are always confused. What the hell is he about? It's very important for me because if they make any conclusions, then it's very hard to work with them. Confusion means at least you realize you don't know, which is good. If somebody comes to know by a very deep experience, that is fine with me. That's another state. But drawing nice conclusions about somebody, is not necessary, drawing bad conclusions about somebody is not necessary. So all honorifics come from this, that people draw positive conclusions about somebody. The value of who I am is only when you simply look at me without any conclusions, you will see, you will be so thoroughly confused. You've not paid enough attention, to me because most of the time you're sitting, seeing me sitting here in a satsang or this kind of situation. So you have not seen me in various situations. If you see me in various situations, you will be thoroughly confused, which is a very good thing. That means you are unable to draw a conclusion because conclusion is death. Conclusion means no more possibility. If you draw a conclusion about me, unknowingly, as a seeker, you will draw a conclusion about yourself. That means seeking is over. Once you draw a conclusion, where is the seeking? You calling yourself a, yourself a seeker is absolutely meaningless. About the vibrations in Berlin, well, outside vibrations have stopped, is that what she's saying? Oh, the automobiles are not thundering around. Well, I also like to drive and ride, but uh, 
it's all right. Maybe every year, we should think about this really as a world, as a generation. Every year three weeks, no automobiles on the road, everybody stays home. Hello? What's the problem? Nothing will happen. Everybody at once, turn off every damn thing in the world. Like school children break for their vacation, all human beings take a break. Oh, every other creature on the planet will celebrate. So if all the machines in Berlin have come to a standstill, the German automobiles are not thundering around. So now, am I understanding the question? She's saying how to manage interiority or what about the inner vibrations? What is that? Could you shed some light on the inner vibrations and the inner sound? Given that outside has become quiet, but the inner has become more noisy. Oh. Inner or interiority has not become noisy, it's never been noisy, there is no such thing as noise in that region. It is just that uh, because you are not busy, you are getting preoccupied. Most people normally think they are busy, but if you look at their lives, sixty percent of the time they're just preoccupied with something. This is like... Uh, chewing the cud, you know, what happened yesterday, you're still chewing. This facility is not there in your body. Cows, goats, sheep, they all have this facility that they can eat today and after a few hours they can bring it back and chew the cud. Such a facility was not given to you in your body, so you have created one in your mind. This is an evolutionary problem, you're not willing to come out of the four-legged state that <laughs> you want to chew yesterday's cud. In the southern Indian uh, mysticism and yoga, we look at people and if they are either enjoying or suffering only what has happened in the past, because of past activity, now they're enjoying something, but doing something totally different now, not understanding that they're just enjoying past benefits and it may run out any time. We say, Ayo, Palay Sadam. Palay Sadam means old rice, that means this is old food. Enjoying old food, what we ate yesterday, right now it is still in terms of energy and strength is still working in our body. Similarly, what we did yesterday or ten years ago or a lifetime ago, maybe still we are benefiting from it. But if you're not doing something right now to enhance this, this will run out. Old food will rot after some time. What was very wonderful will become very nasty after some time. A whole lot of so-called successful people in the world go through this at different stages in their life, that they will be enjoying the results and karmas of the past. And they think everything is fantastic, they live wantonly now. One day suddenly it hits them, not necessarily from outside, most of the time it's from within. Their own psychological structure, their own body goes into such a relapse, they can't believe that this happened to them. This is because you're living on old food. It's important you cook fresh food every day, it's very important. This is why present karma is very important. I want you to understand there is no noise in your interiority. There is no vibration in your interiority, there is no sound in your interiority. It is all in your head. This is because you're chewing the old cud. Now, if you are busy with some activity, you would forget some of the things that are happening in your head today. But once your hands are not engaged, then you see this will go on. So what should I do? Well, we have taught you many ways, you don't try to stop it because you cannot stop it. The only way is you can distance yourself. 
from it. While there are many methods to distance yourself, if you're doing Shambhavi or Shunya, definitely there's a powerful process, otherwise you can do Isha Kriya. If you don't know any of these things right now, the simple thing is just this. You have to just look at yourself and see. You are a tiny little creature in this vast existence, we don't know where it begins, where it ends. On this little mud ball of a planet, you sit here and you think you're the center of the universe, it's a stupid idea. Everything is from this basis that you think you are the center of the universe. It's a very stupid idea. From this stupid idea, many stupid ideas have come, which is your... which is socially considered intelligence. So you just look at your thoughts in the context of larger cosmos, now the virus is threatening your life. In the context of your mortality, the things that you think about, the things that you think are important, every one of them is stupid. If you see your mind is, your thought, your emotion is utterly stupid, naturally you will create distance. The problem is you think it is smart. And now when it troubles you, you want it little away. No, whatever you think it is smart will sit on your shoulder like a badge. It will not go. It will not leave you. The moment you think you are smart, your thoughts cannot leave you. You cannot close your eyes and sit if you're a very smart guy. Just know this, when you know you're a bloody fool, you can close your eyes and sit. In terms of life, in terms of existence, you really nothing, okay? Socially you may be something, among fools, fools will shine. That doesn't mean anything, as a life, as a life, tomorrow this silly little virus can knock you off. Yes, you are me, I'm saying. It can just knock us off. So whatever great smart things we are thinking doesn't mean a damn thing. If you understand this, naturally there will be a distance between you and your thought process. Once there is a distance between you and your thought process, it doesn't matter what you're thinking at all. Yoga Yoga Yogeshwaraya Bhuta Bhuta Bhuteshwaraya Kala Kala Kaleshwaraya Shiva Shiva Sarve Shambha, Shambha, Mahadev.